All right. So uh, here we are. I'm redoing the uh, lecture for Chapter 11, Vibrations and Waves. The uh, previous incarnation was created with the uh, Adobe Connect software, and it was, it was pretty poor. So uh, we're going to start with some basic uh, definitions and, and uh, stuff. Uh, we're going to start, actually, by learning about uh, simple harmonic motion. And as you can imagine, that's one of my favorite topics in all of physics, uh, simple harmonic motion. So my name's in it. Um, it's really funny. Harmonic motion is any motion that uh, repeats with a regular period. In fact, maybe I should write that down just as a sidebar here, just at harmonic motion is any motion that repeats. with a regular period. In other words, it takes the same time uh, to go away and back. So you can think of a pendulum or anything like that, that that vibrates back and forth. They all have harmonic motion. And um, when I give this lecture, um, I usually make a point of pacing in front of the class, right? I go back and forth from one side of the board to the other. And eventually somebody will notice in the lecture hall or in the classroom, Hey, you're doing simple harmonic motion. Oh, it's kind of funny. It's a, it's a nice little icebreaker. Uh, we're going to focus on simple harmonic motion, uh, which is often abbreviated just SHM. And that way you don't have to write out all these letters each time. Simple harmonic motion. Now, simple harmonic motion has a couple of things about it that make it very special. First of all, SHM requires a linear restoring force. It's interesting G I right there. Okay, whatever. You'll get the idea. So all harmonic motion has a restoring force. If the object moves away from the center, something has to bring it back so that it can repeat some sort of oscillatory motion. But simple harmonic motion is one in which the restoring force is linear. That is to say proportional to distance. Um, springs are an excellent example of this. The more you stretch a spring, the harder it pulls back, you know, up into a point where it snaps. And because of that, simple harmonic motion is described mathematically with sines and cosines. So the equations will be very easy to understand. The motion is very easy to understand, very smooth sinusoidal type of motion. So we're going to focus on one example and take it apart. You know, let me see if I can make this a little simpler looking by underlining the topic. Um, we're going to focus on a classic example of the mass and spring system, which is even better than a pendulum as an example of this. And uh, if you really want to get advanced after you're done watching my videos here, I make some videos for the AP class. Uh, most of my AP videos uh, have the letters AP in front of them. So look for AP simple harmonic motion or AP oscillation and see what, what comes up. Uh, the math will be a little more uh, intense, and, but the presentation is quicker. So let's draw what a mass and spring system is in, in an idealized case. First of all, we need some sort of rigid wall that we're going to attach our spring to. And then there's some sort of floor to hold everything up. But this floor needs to be frictionless. So we write mu equals zero. Sitting on this floor is going to be some sort of block or box or some other massive object. And so it can slide back and forth. But we, if we just slide it, it'll slide away and go off forever. So we're going to connect it to the wall with a spring. And the spring is characterized by a spring constant k. So mass is how heavy or massive the box is, and k is how stiff or strong the spring is. That means that first thing we need to do is say that the restoring force is going to be k times x. k is the spring constant, and x is the amount of the stretch. Or compression, I suppose. If you push the spring in, it will uh, it will push out. In fact, um, a lot of people write this down as f equals minus kx because you'll notice that if you displace the object out this way in what would maybe be the positive direction of displacement, then the force that you get is in the opposite direction. 
Now, I don't think we need to write that with a minus sign. We just need to be conscious of this fact. It is indeed a restoring force, so it will always bring things back to the uh, center. And, and that's another thing that should be on the drawing. Uh, we should put a little thing here. This is the origin. This is the equilibrium position. At this position, the spring is not stretched or compressed. The stretch is zero at this location, and so the spring won't do anything. Um, spring constant itself is measured in units of newtons per meter because, of course, we get uh, newtons of force out of every meter of stretch, and stretch is then measured in meters. Uh, springs that have a very high number for the spring constant are very strong, very hard to uh, compress and stretch. Things like your garage door springs, whether you have the twisty kind or the linear up and down ones, or those springs that are under that, uh, what is it, that plastic uh, chicken and duck or whatever or at the park. Uh, you know, the kids are supposed to sit on these things and bounce around. Well, I found as a kid, you know, with almost no body mass, that I sat on those things and they were very boring. I'll tell you what, as an adult, those things are a lot of fun. I can get them you know, perpendicular uh, to their original position <laughs> if I try. Uh, it can be dangerous, though. Um, let's see now. What else do we need to say about this? Uh, so we have our equilibrium position. We have a frictionless surface, the wall to which the spring is attached. We have a restoring type of force. And so I guess we just really need to get into what's going to happen when we, uh, when we twang this thing, when we disturb it a little bit. And that's exactly what I'm going to draw here. Now, this is going to take a moment, and you want to probably do the same thing over a, a fairly large section of your, your notes. Um, I know I'm working the paper in a landscape mode, and you're probably working in the up and down uh, uh, portrait mode. So this should probably take up about a third of a page and go from C to C. That way, um, I mean, I think a big diagram gives you room to put some notes. So I'm going to draw four of these pictures of our mass and spring system. One at the top, one on the right, three o'clock on the clock, six o'clock, and nine o'clock. And I know these aren't the best drawings, but we already know what we're dealing with here. We, and each of these drawings is going to have the equilibrium position somewhere. And I haven't really measured these out. These are conceptual drawings. And these are going to be uh, different stages of the motion. So we're going to start with the one at the top, and we're going to move clockwise in a rational way. And we're going to start this thing by moving the mass to the side a distance A. So instead of being at the equilibrium position, the mass is now here at position A. That means that the spring has been stretched. OK, if you were to do that, pull this thing to the side and then let go, then you know the first thing that would happen over here to this drawing is it would return to its equilibrium position and the spring would then be back at its normal unstretched length, but this thing would be moving. So as a result of moving, it will then overshoot its equilibrium position and wind up in here somewhere. As a matter of fact, for a linear restoring force, this will be exactly minus A. And the spring will now be compressed. And a compressed spring will push the other way, and so this thing will then return to its equilibrium position with the spring in its relaxed normal length, but this mass will be moving and will overshoot, returning us to the initial drawing. So once disturbed to the side, this thing will go through this process, these phases of operation, and return back to the starting point. So this is truly a cycle or a cyclical process. And you can start it with this drawing, but you could also start it with this drawing. You could start with a mass at the origin and you come in with your foot and you could kick it towards the wall and then it would do this and return to this position so no matter what you do to start it or pull it back this way and let go and then it goes around so um, you can start anywhere you want and you still get the same result so one of the first things uh, that's uh, interesting to look at is okay of course we have a and minus a that's kind of cool that symmetry um, we could work out what this velocity is uh, given all the information and we would do that by looking at the energy. If you look at the energy, this thing here is not moving, so it has no kinetic energy, but that spring is stretched, so it has potential energy. Over here, the spring is back at its natural length and has no more potential energy, but this mass is moving, so it has kinetic energy. Here we have a compressed spring, so that's potential energy, and here it's all kinetic energy. 
So the energy is washing back and forth between potential and kinetic and potential and kinetic. And it's not always going to be 100% potential and then suddenly it's all kinetic. No, in any intermediate position over here, you would have a mixture of potential and kinetic. But the beauty of the law of conservation of energy is that this number here will equal the sum of these two numbers here will equal that number there. So you can actually solve for some things using energy. Um, in case you don't understand what's going on here, uh, the mixture of potential and kinetic, let's quickly draw this down here. What would that look like? Well, we would be somewhere between A and the origin with our mass. And so the spring wouldn't be quite as stretched, so not quite as much potential energy, but the mass would be moving, but then again, not quite as fast as it will when it returns to the origin. So that's why we would have some potential energy and some kinetic energy, and those two would add back up to the original amount. Um, there's some other things I want to say about this. Uh, we're going to talk about some things, um, uh, energy, excellent for solving for things like velocity and position and stuff like that, but energy can't help you with time. I say this a lot to my AP students because it's really important. They have to decide what technique to use to solve any given problem. Um, so if you want to know what's going to happen as a function of time, like how long is this going to take, um, energy won't be able to help you. But if you want to say, hey, I pulled it aside, you know, 10 centimeters, how fast is it going to be going when it returns to the equilibrium position? You can certainly do that with energy. So let's talk about the motion, and let's talk about the motion as a function of time. So that's something that we want to be able to do here. We want to say, hey, what is the position of this thing as a function of time? And so we can do that graphically by just drawing what it looks like. So we know we're going to start with this object pulled out at distance A, and then it's going to return to the origin. And then down here, minus A. Then it's going to go a distance minus A, and then it's going to return to the origin, and then it's going to go back to the beginning a distance A away. And then, of course, there will be repetition of this motion. I am not a math teacher, therefore my uh, sine and cosine drawings are not as beautiful as they are in the math department. Those people spend a lot of time practicing, I think. But this is clearly a cosine curve. So we start at position A, we go through the origin, and you can see that uh, this is going to repeat the motion. And the time it takes to repeat the motion is to go from here to here, and that's going to be one period of the motion. And then, of course, it does it again and again and again. So we have uh, a graph of the motion. What about the velocity? What would the velocity as a function of time look like? Well, we can think our way through that one as well. In the drawing, the top drawing, the velocity of the mass was zero, and then it headed back towards the origin. So it went into negative territory. OK, can I do this? And then it stopped again. And then it went into positive territory, returning from its compression, and then it stopped again. And then, of course, it will repeat that kind of motion for a long time. This is velocity. This was position. Um, this is clearly a minus sine curve. And it was really important that we go into the negative territory because if you look at this picture, uh, the mass starts moving this way. That's the negative direction on this thing. Okay, now we can get a little crazy and try to figure out acceleration. A couple different ways to figure out acceleration as a function of time. Um, one is to think about what the force is, because, of course, Newton's second law says force equals mass times acceleration. So whatever the force is doing, um, that's what the acceleration is going to be doing. So in the first drawing, the spring is stretched, and it's pulling back in the negative direction. So the acceleration will be in the negative direction some large number and then when it gets to the origin again uh, the spring is not stretched there's no force so there's no acceleration by the way the other way to think about it is to say that uh, acceleration is the slope of the velocity graph so we have a large negative slope then we have no slope so let's do that let's put a dot there something i can see and then we have a large positive slope here and then we have a no slope here and then we have a large negative slope here so we should probably do something that looks like this. OK, somehow getting this right. So this is a minus cosine curve. 
So we can describe the position with a cosine, the velocity with a minus sign, and the acceleration with a minus cosine. And you can go through and think about when each of these things is a maximum versus a minimum. So position is maximum at either end and a minimum when it goes through the origin. Velocity is a maximum when the uh, position is going through the origin. And oh, also, where is your period? So the period is here on this graph, and then here it's going to be right here. So my graphs are not perfect. I have stretched these out. The period should really line up, up and down across these graphs. Um, if I was a cheating person, I would have made perfect drawings of this, and I would have put that piece of paper underneath, and then I could see through and trace, and then you would think that I was awesome at this. But I'd rather just recreate this for you in any kind of slightly kludgy way. There's always perfect versions of these things in the textbook, but they don't create the drawing for you. So you don't get to see uh, and hear the thought process going on behind the drawing. Now, I don't know what this maximum velocity is. We could certainly solve for it. I'd, we could work out what this maximum acceleration is, but it's clear that the maximum uh, position is A. So that brings us to uh, some terminology. So, when doing simple harmonic motion, we can describe it with an amplitude. And the amplitude is the maximum displacement, and it's abbreviated with the letter A. That's why I chose the letter A for the position of that thing, because I knew what was coming. Where that's going to be the amplitude. We can also describe the period of simple harmonic motion. Looks like this pen has given it up. I've been using the UCLA blue a little too much. And that is the amount of time for one cycle. And that's abbreviated with the letter T, as I showed you earlier. Now, what's really interesting is when you work this out, and working it out, uh, uh, well, there's two ways to work it out, one by inspection and one by solving a differential equation. Um, you will find out that the period of the mass and spring system is 2 pi times the square root of, okay, yeah, this pen has definitely given up the ghost, the mass divided by the spring constant. Man, it was so good to know you. Let's have a moment of silence. Okay, pink. And, um, this works out for various reasons, but it is kind of interesting because on the top is the mass, and that is the inertia of the system. I call it the inertial term. Um, the heavier the mass, the more it resists motion, the longer it's going to take to move back and forth. On the bottom, we have the spring constant, which is related to the force. So I call this the force term. And the stronger the spring, the more quickly it wants to pull it back to the origin, so the shorter the period will be. And both of those are under a square root, so they don't have a linear effect on the period. They have some effect. Uh, the 2 pi has to do with uh, uh, getting the units right for cycles per second versus other things. So this is the actual period of a mass spring system. You can predict it if you can measure these two things in advance. Um, this is kind of how, not kind of, this is exactly how um, any battery-powered quartz watch works. Inside is a very small um, quartz oscillator that has a certain mass and a certain spring constant. Yes, quartz is a solid, but when it gets set in vibration, it vibrates with a huge spring constant and a very small mass. So the period is tiny, and these things wiggle a couple thousand times um, a second. And the machine inside the watch simply counts these uh, thousands of vibrations. And when it reaches the right number, uh, then it inc increments the, uh, the watch display by one second and continues on. By the way, speaking of things that happen very quickly, um, there is another concept called frequency, which is used when things happen quickly. And frequency is abbreviated with the letter F. And it is simply the inverse of the period. So whereas this is the number of seconds for one cycle, this would be measured in the number of cycles per second. So that oscillator inside your quartz watch has a frequency of, I think it's 11,500 cycles per second. It doesn't have to be a certain thing. It's just, I, I seem to remember that being printed on the outside of the case of the thing. And cycles per second are often abbreviated with another term named after uh, Friedrich Hertz, I believe. And it's HZ, which stands for Hertz. Not the same Hertz as the rental car, but perhaps related, I don't know.
And hertz are a measure of frequency, cycles per second. And you hear them all the time. In fact, if you listen to the radio, let's say uh, the last FM station I listened to was Jack FM, which is 93.1 megahertz or million hertz or million cycles per second. If you listen to AM radio, that's in the kilohertz range, thousands of cycles per second. If you microwave your food, um, I believe that microwave ovens work at about 2.1 gigahertz or billions of cycles per second. Oh, I just bought a new router for my house out in the desert, and it has two bands. It has a 2.4 gigahertz band, um, which it has longer range but doesn't carry as much information, and it has two separate 5 gigahertz bands uh, for, you know, my uh, gaming <laughs> that I do. All right, sorry. I'm uh, cracking myself up. So this seems like a really good place to stop, plus it's the 20-minute mark. Let's go back through and just mark some things that um, that we should know. There's some terminology about simple harmonic motion, frequency, period, amplitude. These are things that you should understand. You should know that the motion and the velocity and the acceleration all look like sines or cosines, all depending on how you started the system. And they all have a recognizable period, which you know from trigonometry is one, um, one period, one cycle of the thing. You should definitely understand for the mass and spring system uh, the cycle that it goes through and that the energy washes back and forth between potential and kinetic energies. We might play with that a little bit. And then, of course, there's the basic definitional stuff that simple harmonic motion is a repeating motion, but it requires a linear restoring force so that it can be described with sines and cosines. Well, um, the next video will talk about, I believe, the pendulum as a uh, simple harmonic oscillator. And I'll just leave you with the thought that the, the reason why simple harmonic motion is so important is that any even complicated vibratory motion um, like the sound of my beautiful voice, uh, can be thought of as breaking down into a whole bunch of simple harmonic motion happening at the same time. So an understanding of simple harmonic motion allows you to then build an understanding of much more advanced systems.